Hi everyone, Dr. Mike here. In this video, we're gonna talk about everybody's favorite physiological concept when it comes to skeletal muscle, which is the sliding filament theory. But before we begin, we need to talk about some really important terms that we need to wrap our head around before we can move on. First thing is, what you're gonna find is when we start talking about skeletal muscle, there is some important prefixes that you need to understand. These prefixes include that of sarco and that of myo. Now, importantly, what you're going to find is sarco is Greek for muscle. Myo is Latin for muscle. And they seem to be used as a prefix, so in front of words, when we start talking about skeletal muscle in various aspects. So, for example, there's a term called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. That is simply the endoplasmic reticulum for skeletal muscle. We have the sarcolemma. That is simply the plasma membrane of skeletal muscle. Right? We've got the sarcoplasm, that's the cytoplasm of skeletal muscle. Now when we look at myo, we've got a myocyte, that's a muscle cell. We've got a myofibril, which is what myocytes are made out of. And we've got myofilaments, which are the contractile proteins that allow for muscle to contract. So just so you know, these two prefixes pretty much mean the same thing etymologically, so their origin is just slightly different. All right? Sarco is Greek, myo, is Latin. Now that we've done that, let's talk a little bit about some anatomy. So what you can find here is we have a whole skeletal muscle right here. This is the bicep, right? Sitting right here. Importantly, we take this whole muscle and we transplant it right there. What you'll find is that whole muscle is comprised of multiple bundles that we call fascicles. So let's just pull one of those fascicles out. We're going to find that these fascicles are made up of multiple muscle fibers, and we pull one of those out. Now importantly, when we talk about muscle cells, aka myocytes, we're talking about a muscle fiber. So here's the thing, this muscle fiber is the muscle cell. So a muscle fiber is also known as a myocyte and also known as a muscle cell right there. And you can see, as a muscle cell, if you remember back on the three different types of muscle of the body, and you talk about some of the differences, you know that skeletal muscle is cylindrical, as you can see here. It's striated, it's got those stripes, and it has multiple nuclei, which you can see here by those purple dots. Now, interestingly, the muscle fiber is made up of more components. These components are called myofibrils, and I'm pulling one of those myofibrils out, and you can see it's the myofibrils that have those stripes, also known as striations. And the myofibrils are made up of myofilaments, and these are the contractile proteins that you can see here. Now, the myofilaments, the contractile proteins, are actin and myosin. And if we label those, this one here is actin, and this one here is myosin. And importantly, myosin is the thick, Contractile protein, actin is the thin contractile protein, and we'll get there in a sec. So overall, when skeletal muscle contracts, what's happening is these proteins are shortening, which shortens the myofibril, which shortens the muscle fiber, and importantly, muscle fibers will run, or 98% of muscle fibers run the full length of the whole muscle. So that means when this muscle fiber shortens, the fascicle shortens, the whole muscle shortens, and because skeletal muscles cross at least one joint usually, you've got movement of the skeleton, and that's the whole purpose of skeletal muscle. Now let's move back here to the myofibril. Couple of things. You're gonna see these different banding patterns, and you can see this under the microscope. Now these different bands or regions have different names. All right, so for example, we've got the A band here. We've got the I band, which is actually sitting around about here. Now, here's the thing. An A band is the darker band, right? It comprises Interestingly, if we were to have a look at this A-band, of regions in which the myofilaments, the myosin and actin, which you can see here. So in green, that's the myosin. In blue, that's the actin. You can see that there's parts in which they overlap. These parts that they overlap is going to be where you find dark bands. These dark bands here of the A-band. Now, areas in which they don't overlap, so these areas here, which is gonna be these areas here, right? Now you can see Z-disc. Z-disc is this line here. Why is it called Z-disc? Because it looks like a Z, right? So there's the Z-disc right there. So Z-disc is corresponding to that area there. So this white band here is corresponding to this band here, where there's no overlap between those two protein filaments, 
That's also known as the I band, all right? Where it's lighter. Where it's darker, the A band, that's where we've got all this overlap. Now you can see in the middle here, this is called the M line, and I like to call it the M line because you've got those three lines, and if you just to connect them up, it looks like the letter, letter M. So that's the M line, simply the center point of this. The reason why I've highlighted one Z disc to another Z disc is because when these proteins bind to each other and contract or shorten, which is gonna be the focus of this lecture, we're gonna get there in one second. This is the smallest unit of contraction, which we call the sarcomere. The sarcomere is the smallest unit of contraction. All right, let's now have a look at this. Importantly, we need to know how does this thing bind and contract? So first thing is we need to look at that muscle fiber and you need to remember from one of my previous lectures, the neuromuscular junction, that you're gonna have a motor neuron, a lower motor neuron that's coming down and it's gonna be speaking to this muscle fiber. It doesn't bind to it, there's a little gap. So it goes from neuron, gap, muscle, and it's known as the neuromuscular junction. So watch my neuromuscular junction video. If you don't understand it, I'll give you a very quick run through here. This is a lower motor neuron. Lower motor neuron. And the signal of the lower motor neurons coming from the spinal cord, and I had previously spoken to the upper motor neuron, which originates at the brain, at the motor cortex. It's sending an electrical signal down. Now, once it gets to the end, it releases a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. And acetylcholine will bind to acetylcholine receptors on that muscle fiber. Now, the sarcolemma, what was the sarcolemma again? That was the plasma membrane, right? of the muscle fiber. Once acetylcholine binds to acetylcholine receptors, it opens up sodium channels and sodium rushes in. Now remember back on action potentials. If you haven't watched my action potential video, watch that. Action potential, sodium rushes in. Now when you get sodium rushing in, it brings its positive charge with it because we all know that sodium has a positive charge, right? So now when you've got, let's just say that this is the muscle cell, and you've got sodium sitting outside and now sodium's rushed inside, it's taken that positive charge with it and it depolarizes the membrane. It doesn't go deep within the cell, it just depolarizes this membrane right here. So you get this depolarization of the sarcolemma, but importantly, what we need to realize here is depolarization just of the membrane isn't good enough because if you have a look, we want muscle to contract, whole muscle to contract. Muscle isn't just the membrane. You can see it's made up of all these individual thousands in actual fact, myofibrils. So we need depolarization to go deep within the muscle fiber itself. So what you're gonna find is that there are these tubules, these tunnels that run all the way through these muscle fiber, they're called T-tubules. And the action potential doesn't just go across the sarcolemma, it runs down these tubules and goes deep, deep, deep within that muscle fiber, importantly. Now, once the depolarization has happened deep, all of this is the neuromuscular junction, and in that video, I'll go into great detail. Once it goes in, it releases calcium. Now, importantly, you've got depolarization going down the T-tubules. It reaches something called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. What did I say that was? That's the endoplasmic reticulum for muscle fibers. The sarcoplasmic reticulum, you need to remember, remember, is it just pulls or stores calcium. And whenever calcium is released, muscle contraction will occur. So we're getting there, right? So we've got all this depolarization happening and you've got the sarcoplasmic reticulum sitting deep within the muscle tissue. It's holding on to all this calcium. Once the depolarization is released, calcium is released. All right, stay there, keep that in your mind. What we've just run through is an action potential has just gone down the lower motor neuron, released acetylcholine. Acetylcholine binds to acetylcholine receptors, allows for sodium to move in to the sarcolemma, depolarizing it. It needs to go deep within the muscle. So it goes down T-tubules and depolarizes deep within that muscle fiber. Once it depolarizes deep within the muscle fiber, it tells the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release all that stored calcium. And now calcium is floating freely throughout that muscle fiber. Let's go back here. We've now got the myosin, which is that green thick chain, and the actin, which is that blue chain. We've also got this orange thing here, this springy thing. This is a very big 
protein molecule called titan. It's actually one of the biggest protein molecules and it's a spring and it holds that myosin into the Z disc so that when contraction occurs, when contraction occurs, it can spring back, all right? So importantly, something that you need to be aware of is when we look at the myosin, it's got these little arms with these little heads on it, like golf clubs. So it's got these arms with these heads on it. And these heads want to bind to binding pockets on this actin. But here's the thing, they can't. And the reason why they can't bind to these binding pockets on actin is that there is a bike chain that's wrapped around this actin that will not let the myosin heads bind to that pocket. So if I were to just draw that up a little bit better over here, make it a little bit bigger, right? Let's draw up the actin. Let's draw up the myosin. Okay. The myosin head wants to bind to binding pockets in that actin. And the thing is, it can't. And the reason why it can't is because there is a bike chain that's wrapped around that actin. Now this bike chain, think about it. If the actin is a bike and you want to hop on that bike and take it for a ride, and there's a bike chain wrapped around it, that bike chain is useless without a padlock. So there's also going to be a padlock on here. So you need to open that padlock. So once you open the padlock, the bike chain falls away. If the bike chain falls away, the bike is available. The actin is available for the mice and heads to bind. Now here's the thing. This bike chain is called tropomyosin. That lock is called troponin. We need a key for that lock. Once we have a key for that lock, the whole thing opens up and the actin is available for the mice and heads to bind to. What's the key? Well, where did we stop in this process of the neuromuscular junction? We stopped at the point where calcium was released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Calcium is the key. Now I've got all this calcium floating around. Once calcium comes along, calcium ions specifically, it is the key. It will bind to this padlock, the troponin. Open that padlock up and the tropomycin falls away. If the tropomycin falls away, these mice and heads can bind to their binding pockets and we can start that sliding filament mechanism. So first aspect here is the first thing we need is that calcium binding. Now that calcium binding releases troponin and tropomyosin complex. So now we have free actin for the mice and heads to bind, but they still can't bind yet. This is the thing. We need step two to occur. What's step two? Well, think about it. Anytime you want some activity, some action to occur, we need what? ATP. So we know that there's huge amounts of mitochondria floating within muscle fibers, and the mitochondria through oxidative phosphorylation and the electron transport chain produce huge amounts of ATP. So we've got ATP floating around. Now ATP needs to come along and this is what happens with ATP. Let's zoom in now on one of these mice and heads. So I've got one of these mice and heads here and I might just draw up some actin like that. The mice and head needs to first cock into position, right? then it needs to bind to the actin. So let's get this down. Myosin head needs to cock into position and then it needs to bind to the actin. Then it needs to perform a power stroke and move the actin. When it does that and it moves the actin, it shortens that whole sarcomere from Z disc to Z disc. The whole thing shortens. So it does that. Then it needs to disassociate, cock back into position, bind, power stroke, release cock back into position, bind, power stroke, release. And this is muscle contraction, muscle shortening. How does ATP play a role here? This is what happens. The myosin head's just sitting here. ATP comes along and binds. 
ATP will then disassociate into ADP and phosphate. Remember, ATP is adenosine triphosphate, there's three. So if you take one off, it becomes adenosine diphosphate, ADP, and a single phosphate. When you release a phosphate from ATP, this is the energy that we have to be able to do things. So that ATP, this is the first step, will then disassociate and form ADP and phosphate. And that phosphate and ADP stay on the myosin. But when that happens, it allows, that energy allows for the head to cock and bind. So now that's cocked into position and is now bound to the actin. But we still have the ATP and phosphate there, right? We've still got the A, so ADP and phosphate. Now what happens is the ADP and phosphate will be released. And when they release, that head will go back into position. But when it goes back into position, what do you think happens to that actin molecule? It slides. And that's known as the power stroke. So that power stroke, ADP and phosphate are released. And the head moves. Now the thing is the head, myosin head, is stuck to that actin molecule until another ATP molecule comes along. When another ATP molecule comes along and binds, the ATP binding releases the head and we're back at the start. Then what happens? Let's talk it through, right? It's really important. Let's talk it through. Myosin head, actin molecule. We need the head to cock and bind ATP binds to the myosin head. ATP then disassociates to ADP and phosphate. Cocks the myosin head and binds. The ADP and phosphate jump off. The head performs a power stroke, but it's stuck. ATP comes along and binds, releases the myosin head. ATP disassociates to ADP and phosphate, right? The head cocks and binds. ADP and phosphate disassociate. Power stroke, ATP, uh, the myosin head stuck. We need more ATP, disassociate. ATP goes to ADP and phosphate, Cox binds. ADP and phosphate disassociate, power stroke. It's stuck, ATP comes and the whole thing repeats. This is the sliding filament mechanism that occurs. So then the second thing that happens is we need ATP to bind, then it turns to or disassociates into ADP and phosphate. This equals the cock and bind. Then ADP and phosphate, let's just say leave. That results in power stroke. ATP binds, and the whole thing happens again. Release, and then we're back at the start again. All right, so this is what's happening in this sliding filament mechanism. When this whole thing, these myosin heads bind to the actin, and they perform this power stroke, they're pulling it inward. So these two actin molecules here, they come closer and closer and closer towards that M line to the middle. And that is a shortening of the whole sarcomere, right? The smallest contractile subunit of the myofibril and the whole muscle shortens. That shortens, that shortens, that shortens, that shortens. The whole thing shortens and you've got skeletal muscle contraction. That is the sliding filament mechanism.